Okay, this is going to be lecture number 11, and this lecture is going to deal with the American Civil War. This lecture is going to cover the Civil War time period, and it might be in two parts. It depends on how long it gets on this first one. Um, I'm going to give it up after three hours or two and a half hours, and I'll go and start over if we need to with another with another half of this lecture. But um, this lecture is pretty long. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting lecture too, but we're going to try to cover a Civil War that's normally a 12-hour class at Florida State in a matter of about three and a half to four hours. So it's it's going to be kind of a interesting uh, lecture here, trying to get all this stuff done and, and move on to the reconstruction and, the, and then be through with all these lectures for History One class. I do want to start off by telling you some things you should know of uh, what caused this war. This war is just as much a political war as it is a war over slavery. Slavery is the main issue. But politics has let America down during this time period. We had no strong presidents uh, after John Quincy Adams, and he was not that strong himself because of how Jackson uh, and his gang treated him as, during his presidency. But I want to start back and tell you all that this war actually began at the very, the very beginning of American history. Uh, when the southern colonies were developed and the northern colonies were developed, Back here in the 18s and back here in the 16, uh, 20, 1630 time period, that's where it started dividing. The American South was agrarian. Their main concern was sending raw materials to England, particularly tobacco. New England was more manufacturing. They were more concerned with shipping uh, and, and building an economy based on local artisans. So both colonies, both the, both the southern colonies and the northern colonies, started off in a very different manner. And then you have the beginning of the French and Indian War, where the British Board of Trade called, called for the Albany Congress, and the South didn't show up. The South was not interested in the economic situations involving the northern, the northern colonies and France, and that's going to cause a split. But I think one of the major, the major problems is going to be when George Washington has to send Nathaniel Green to the South to turn the South into patriots. The South were still being loyal to England. And so that's going to be a major issue toward this war. You're already seeing the South being defiant and not wanting to join the, not be joining to join the cause here that's, that's, being, that's being formulated by the, by the Sons of Liberty. They just didn't trust it. So you have that going on. And then, of course, you have the American Constitution and the American Bill of Rights. Slavery should, should have been dealt with in this time period. Slavery should have been dealt with, and they should have had a time scheduled either in slavery or in slavery at the, at the adoption of the Constitution. And nobody wanted to do that in this time period. And George Washington really noted that this is going to be a major problem in the future here. Um, that we should be looking at the ending of slavery, that all men are created equal regardless of their background, their heritage, or their lineage. 
And so you got a major problem here with the Constitution. The Bill of Rights went through and gave us states' rights and gave us personal rights, which is going to filter into the slavery issue. The state said they had the right to slavery because the Constitution did not discuss it. Individuals say we have the right to slavery because the Constitution did not deal with it. So you got a major problem. And then it says property belongs to you regardless of where you move to across the country. So you have these issues here, guys, that the Constitution is dealing with. I, I really wish that John Marshall had spent more time dealing with this, but the Supreme Court did not touch the issue of slavery at all until the Dred Scott decision by Roger Tenay in, in, uh, in 1857 time period. That's a long time off here, okay? The next big thing that's going to, that's going to affect slavery is going, is going to be the Louisiana Purchase. This is going to take place because all this land opens up here for settlement, and it allows slavery to expand across the southern tier of the Louisiana Purchase territory. It should have been stopped early on. And then the War of 1812 is another example of the country divided over war. New England did not want this war with, with, uh, with England in, 18, in 1812, but the South was all for it. They wanted to have a war against England. So it reverses here. Revolutionary War, the South was not very cooperative in the war. New England promoted the war. The War of 1812, the South promoted, and New England did not want part of this war. You know, that's why you had the Hartford, the Hartford Convention up here in, in the fall of, of the fall of 1814, in which the northern states discusses secession from the Union. So you have this major problem. Then right behind that comes the opening of the land from the Indian Wars during the War of 1812, the Shawnee War and the Creek Indian War. And people come flooding in, and expand slavery into these territories. It'd been easier to have ended slavery when slavery was in Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. When slavery goes to Mississippi and Alabama and Tennessee and Kentucky and Missouri and, and Arkansas and Louisiana and Texas, it's gotten out of hand. It's easier to destroy it when it is small not when it gets humongous like it does here after the War of 1812. And then, of course, in 1820, we have the big fight over the Missouri Territory. What should be slave and what should be free? At the same breath, in 1819, the North outlawed slavery. And that should have been a nationwide decision. That should have been a decision made nationwide. It's going to go before the Supreme Court to have been approved, and there have been the end of it but they did not do it. They kicked the can down the road a few more times. All right, and then of course you have the presidency of Andrew Jackson and all the crises that he brought to the table. Indian removal, the bank wars, the South Carolina secession crisis, the gag act we went through and told that the people that slaves could not know, could not be taught how to read and write, and you could not send abolitionist materials to the American South. That's where it starts, guys, really get in, in getting down into the ditch of this war. They started digging the shovel deeper and deeper here, starting with Andrew Jackson. And then your churches turn around and divide over the issue of slavery. The Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians made enemies of each other over the issue of slavery. And that plays a major role into this, okay? Then the Mexican War happened. And all that new frontier, that new territories opened up for American settlement here in the Southwest. That leads to Wilmot Provisto. It leads, it leads to all these political parties like the Anti-Slavery Party. You have the Liberty Party. You have the Free Soil Party. You know, it's crazy. It just totally breaks down here. All right. And then you go on up at the Mexican War, and you have the problem with California wanting to enter, enter the Union, and they bring in that stupid Fugitive Slave Act to go round up slaves. And then you have Franklin Pierce as president, and he lets Jefferson Davis rebuild the military, which is going to be a very, when you industrialize war, guys, it's going to have more destruction and more death than ever before. You're going to start seeing people being killed in the droves here in this war. Other wars, you only had maybe, you know, 100, 200 casualties, which included being wounded and being, being shot dead. 
But here you're going to have thousands of people who are piled up dead from these battles. And it's going to get really, really out of hand here. Okay. And then, of course, you're going to have James Buchanan, who did in, who not do anything as, as a state seceded from the Union. Abraham Lincoln was was a fear force for the South. They were fearful of Abraham Lincoln, even he, even though he told them over and over again, "I am not going to end your slavery." He says, "I am I am not for I'm not against slavery." And he says, "What whatever I do, I do it to preserve the Union." That's his main concern was to preserve the Union here. So you have all this long history of all these failed attempts here, guys. And I just gave you all the short list. When I sat down and wrote down every little decision, every little problem America had, there's over 100 of them. So this war just did not just happen. This war was pretty much created, all right? And it should never have happened. There should have been a better way to solve the problem. And I truly believe that Andrew Jackson was a catalyst behind this, and the churches dividing is going to be the final flaw, the final flaw of all this stuff. And speaking of flaws, look at the American South and how they're going to handle this war. They did not industrialize. They have no industries behind the war effort. As a matter of fact, after battles, a lot of Confederate soldiers were forced to, to the battlefield to pick up spent mini balls and collect these mini balls that had already been used and try to reuse them again trying to go through and smelt down this lead and so forth and make new mini balls out of it. You can't win wars like this. The South will have a food shortage during this war. You can't win wars. You can't feed your armies. You can't clothe your armies. You have problems here, guys. They did not build good railroads across the country. They're mostly going by wagon train. You know, all these little artisans all across the South made war supplies. My mother's hometown of Liberty, Liberty Mississippi, they are going to make bridles here and saddles here. And they got to transport those by wagon all the way to Richmond, Virginia. Well, Liberty is about 100 miles southeast of Natchez. That's a long ways from Liberty to Richmond. And to have to go through and haul this stuff by wagon across the country, it's just totally, it's totally crazy. So these little artisans in Georgia and Alabama, Mississippi and Tennessee, and the Carolinas are trying to send goods up here to Richmond, have to support the war. And these goods takes months to get there. Abraham Lincoln has got railroads that crisscross the South, and they're going 45 miles an hour. You can't win wars when it's like this, okay? The South did not have good telegraph, te telegraph service because they didn't have the railroads. The telegraph went with the railroad system. And Mr. Lincoln is able to build a computer in front of the White House. There's a building across the street from the White House. And they brought telegraph lines in from all over the country. And they had several dozen men who operated telegraphs in that building. And all the information would come in from the battlefront. Abraham Lincoln would go over and review it and send orders to his generals. Because he was a central command. It was a central command center here. They knew where everybody was, what was going on. If, if General Meade sent word to, to uh, President Lincoln or to the, to the telegraph office that he needs the supplies, the supplies were ordered over the telegraph machines. They were sent orders all over the country, all over the North. If they needed mini balls, they sent the telegram to Springfield, Illinois, where they made mini balls, you know? And those mini balls would be at Gettysburg in about two days. How long would it take to get mini balls from Mobile to, to, uh, to Richmond? Even caring about horseback, my Ponies Express horseback is still going to take several days, about a week, in order to do all this stuff. So the South had many fatal flaws. They didn't have a good banking system. Their currency was totally worthless. The Confederate dollars are worth more today than they were in the 1860s. Those collectors pay more money for Confederate dollars today than they did in the 1860s. You can't win wars like this, guys. You cannot win wars like this. You've got to have, you've got to have the manpower, you've got to have the supply routes, you've got to have the communications. Without this, you will not make it. And remember also, the war is going to be three Union soldiers for every one Confederate soldier. You can't win wars like this. There's just no way. 
So we start off, guys, by looking at both sides here and what's going on here and how this war actually evolves, okay? So that's a good place for us to start here this, this, uh, this, that, this morning with this, with this lecture here, okay? Now, the Northern people have agreed to vote. They all voted in November of 1860. They elected Abraham Lincoln, who was confirmed by the Electoral College. This did not go to the House of Representatives for a decision. They went to the Electoral College. And Mr. Lincoln was a clear winner because the Democrats had split the vote. You had a Southern Democrat, Mr. Breaking Ridge, and you had a Northern Democrat, Mr. Stephen Douglas, and these two split the vote. And this put Abraham Lincoln into the White House. And of course, when this happens, the Southern states, they begin to discuss secession. And the first one out was South Carolina. South Carolina goes out on, this, on December the 20th, 1860. They're very quick out of here. And then about two weeks later in January, Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama, and Georgia secede from the Union. And then within a couple more weeks, you have Louisiana and you have uh, the state of Texas. So your first seven states out of the Union were Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina. Okay, so South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas are out of the Union here by the middle part of January of 1861. Okay, now inauguration for the President of the United States takes place on March the 4th, 1861. Abraham Lincoln decided his best bet was not to travel. There have been a lot of attempts, a lot of talk that somebody is going to shoot and kill Lincoln. That assassination was in the works for Abraham Lincoln. Okay? So Abraham Lincoln decided to stay home in Springfield, Illinois during this time period. Every morning, Monday through Friday, he had a press conference from his front porch. The news media would come to his front porch. The newspaper men would come to his front porch. They'd send their reports to their papers by telegram out of Springfield, Illinois. And each morning in the newspapers, you had an article, you had some information about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln tells the American people during this time period, I am not going to enslave. My main concern is to preserve the union, to keep the union intact, keep it together. And we can deal with slavery <clears throat> by peaceful means. There's no point of going to a big war here over, over the issue of slavery. You know, when the South seceded, a lot of your Northern newspapers, a lot of your politicians from the North told them, said, go in peace. Just go in peace. Y'all go from down there and y'all start your own country in the South. And once you fall apart, we'll come back and pick, it, pick up the pieces. Charles Sumner told them this. So Charles Sumner, a Massachusetts senator who got beat up by Preston Brooks, who, who vowed a revenge on the South, he told them, y'all go on. Y'all go in peace. And when it falls apart, you'll have me to deal with. I'll make sure that you're not easily brought back into the country. We'll find a way to reconstruct you and bring you back in hollering and screaming. You're going to pay and pay dearly for leaving the country here in this time period. So you have a lot of people up north saying, let them go. Don't worry about this. They're not going to make it. They're going to have all kinds of problems down here. And when they do, we'll just simply come back in there and pick up the pieces and start all over again. Okay? So you've got some really interesting situations going on here uh, in this time period. Okay? Now, on the second Monday of January, Jefferson Davis, senator from Mississippi, is going to go over to the Senate. And he's going to tell his colleagues here goodbye. I want you guys to realize about, about Jefferson Davis. People respected him. The people from the Northern, the Northern senators had a lot of respect for Mr. Davis, including Abraham Lincoln. Um, these men were all civil to each other. They had lunch together from time to time. They met in committee meetings from time to time. They knew each other. They're not enemies, guys. They're actually brothers. They're brothers in the Senate. Okay? Jefferson Davis comes in here on this, on this second Monday of January, and he tells the people here in the Senate goodbye. 
I'm going home to my beloved South. I'm hoping that a war does not break out. And he says, I'm hoping that when I go back to my home country, back to my home region, that they will select me to be their minister to the United States. I would love to come back up here and be the minister to the South. He says, if I'm not going to be a minister to the South, I'd rather be a general. But my, my main concern is I want to be a minister from the South. The job he does not want is president of the Confederacy. He does not want this job. Him and his wife, Arena, and the three boys all go back down to Woodville, Mississippi, down in Richardson County, Mississippi. That's the southern west, the south, the southwesternmost county of Mississippi. They're almost, they're almost in Baton Rouge. All right. And guys, here he starts working in his rose garden. He loved his beloved rose garden here and he had a large, big, beautiful house here in Woodville. He had a big house also in Biloxi. And Jefferson Davis sits here and he tinkers around his house, mainly in his rose garden, all right? Mr. Lincoln is scared for his life up here and he decides that he better hire some guards to guard him, all right? During this time period, we do not have a secret service. That does not happen until 1901 after William McKinley is assassinated. We're gonna go through three assassinations before they finally get smart and put a, put a secret service group into place to protect the president. So he's going to hire the Pinkerton guards. The Pinkertons will come and guard him. As he travels to New York City for the big inaugural balls, the Pinkertons go with him. After he's inaugurated, the United States Army is going to protect the president. And they'll put Army guys in the White House, on the White House grounds. There'll be Army, Army men who will be on the carriages and the wagons that he travels in. When he goes on a trip by train or by buggy, the guards are always with him. So guys, the Army is going to protect the President of the United States after he's inaugurated. But, on the, but in the beginning, he's on his own here. Toward the middle part of February, 1861, Abraham Lincoln, his wife Mary, and their three boys are going to go to New York City for the big inaugural balls. They do not arrive in Washington, D.C. until the 3rd of March. They arrive in the middle of the night. A lot of folks says that Abraham Lincoln came into the presidency as a thief in the night, that nobody knew that he was here until the inauguration. They kept all that really secret about where he was and what was going on. On March the 4th, he goes to the inaugural platform and he tells the, he tells the American people, we must not be enemies, we must be friends. Though passions have strained us, we must hold on to the bonds of affection. We must stay together as a country, okay? So Lincoln's main concern is to preserve the union. I would remember that. That's a great question for your exam. His main concern was to preserve the union, okay? Jefferson Davis does not want the presidency of the Confederacy, but in early February, those seven states came together in Montgomery, Alabama. They decided that Montgomery, Alabama should be the capital of the South. That would be the great location for the Southern capital to be located. And of course, they considered that Montgomery was a heart of Dixie. The heart of Dixie was Montgomery, Alabama of the Confederacy. These seven states sent representatives to Montgomery and they wrote a constitution. This constitution looks just like the American Constitution, except it does more emphasis on states' rights and has more emphasis on slavery. According to the Southern Constitution, slavery will never end. There'll never be an end to slavery with this constitution. And then these men are going to select who will lead the Confederacy. They chose Jefferson Davis as the president of the Confederacy and they chose Alexander Stevens as the vice president. When Jefferson Davis gets word, he's not real happy, but since they had much faith in him, he decided to go for it. When him and Verena and the children decide to go to, to Montgomery, they decide to go by train. This shows how bad the trains are, in, are across the country. They had to leave Woodville and go to Natchez. In Natchez, they, tra they changed trains. From Natchez, they went to Vicksburg, 
to Greenville, to Clarksdale, to Memphis. And Memphis, they changed trains and took a train that went down to Tupelo and on down toward Columbus, Mississippi, over toward Tuscaloosa, and finally into Montgomery. The trip took seven days. I want to tell you, you could walk from, from Woodville to Greenville probably about six days walking. On horseback or buggy, all you had to do was take the Three Notch Road, which is Highway 84 from Natchez to, to Brookhaven to Laurel to Waynesboro, and you'd come out on the Federal Road about Monroeville, Alabama. From Monroeville, Montgomery is not that far. You could travel it probably in two to three days. If you have several good horses and a good buggy, you could do it easily in three days. But they decided to go by train. It seemed more formal to go by train, and it took a whole lot longer, okay, by doing so. So, guys, they should have gone overland instead of going by train to, to Montgomery. And once they arrive here, Jefferson Davis is sworn in as a Confederate president his vice president, Alexander Stevens. Mr. Stevens is a gay man. I have read his, I've read, read his diaries. I have read his, uh, his, his uh, autobiographies or his biographies written about him. He has a half brother who he was in love with. They write very passionate love letters to each other. And Alexander Stevens is considered to be a dandy in polite Washington, D.C. society. He was a senator from Georgia. He's from Greenville, Georgia. All right. And so he comes in as your vice president. And these two men do not really get along with each other. And over, and over half the time, Stevens is not even in Richmond. He's down in Georgia. He's down there doing work. And he's also guilty toward the end of being guilty of treason. Because at Hampton Roads in 1865, he met privately with Abraham Lincoln. And he was not sanctioned. He was not asked to do so by the Confederate government. He did it on his own. And so you have some real interesting problems here between these two men. They just didn't get along with each other here in this time period. Okay? They're a little bit more too much competitive here in this time period. All right? So guys, this war is going to be mostly a shouting match when it first begins. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama is a perfect place for a Confederacy in the South. Even when Richmond, when we, even when Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas join in later to, to, to add to the Confederacy, Montgomery would have been the best place for them to be located. Montgomery is a naturally fortified city. When you leave Mobile Bay and go up the Mobile River to where the junction takes place, where the river turns northwestwardly on the town Bigby, and then the river turns eastwardly or northeasterly that forms the Alabama River, you got high bluffs along the east side of that river all the way to Montgomery. There be a hard, be hard to go through and, and break through and penetrate those high bluffs here along this river. Remember Claiborne? And I told you about the sliding board. They had to slide the cotton bales down. That's a good example. The river had a high bank. You could fortify that river from Port, from Fort Morgan and Dolphin Island all the way to Montgomery, or all the way to Demopolis, as far as that's concerned, or to Tuscaloosa, and nobody would have gotten in here. The Confederacy could use Pascagoula and Mobile and New Orleans as big centers to build ships with. And they could have built all kinds of warships here, guys, in this area. They could have brought artisans from across the South and house them in Monroeville and Grove Hill and Coffeeville and Selma and all these cities along the river from Mobile to Montgomery and brought these artisans in and built big shops, built big industrial plants and put them in there. And they could have made guns, they could have made bridles, they could have made saddles, they could have made mini balls. 
They could, do, they could do, have done a lot of different things here, guys, industrially along the river. You know, when World War II broke out, Mobile got swamped by people. Over 60,000 people moved to Mobile in 1942 during World War II. And these guys were artisans from across the South. They came to Mobile to get involved in the shipbuilding business. And they built lots of Liberty ships in Mobile during World War II. They could have done it here, guys during the Civil War time period. And they could, they could industrialize that whole river system from the Tongue Baby up the Black Warrior, from the Alabama up the Coosa and Tallapoosa. And the South would have had a powerhouse. They could even industrialize along the Chattahoochee, going up toward Atlanta from, from the Gulf Coast at, at, uh, at Apalachicola. They could have done all of this stuff. And they could have built a powerhouse by doing so. And they had the money from the cotton industry. All right, so they could have done something here early on to industrialize the South. In Montgomery, all they had to do was fortify the southern part of town. If they fortified from the river around to the river, on the, from the western side of the river up to the northern side of the river, they could have totally encompassed the city of Montgomery. They could have brought trench warfare down here, and Montgomery would have been a safe place to go. Now listen to this. If you have 800,000 soldiers, you can run soldiers out of Montgomery to wherever you need them. You have a navy, you could have the Navy go across the go across the Yucatan over to Cuba and back to Key West and totally block out any kind of northern infiltration here into the American South. You could block, you could blockade along the Atlantic coastline if you needed to, to keep them going across the peninsula of Florida. You could find different ways to blockade this area and been safe. Okay. A lot of the guys in the South who are your generals, who are your leaders, fought in Mexico. And they knew the importance of blockading. And they could blockade it themselves to keep the Union from coming in here into this region. Okay. So Montgomery is a natural place for an army. Okay, but what happens here after Fort Sumter, which I'm going to discuss here in a second, after Fort Sumter, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas join, join the Confederacy. And these Confederate leaders have decided to move the capital from Montgomery to Richmond, Tennessee. I mean, to Richmond, Virginia. Richmond is only 80 miles from Washington, D.C. Montgomery is over as close to, what, 900, 800 miles, Washington, D.C.? It's a better distance between the two capitals. When the Confederacy moves to Richmond, they'll have no secrets. There'll be spies and counter spies and all this going on up here. There's no secrets in Washington, D.C. There's no secrets in Richmond. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Okay? But here's the kicker of all of this stuff. If you only have 800,000 soldiers, why would you move them to Richmond, Virginia? It's going to take 400,000 soldiers just to defend the city of Richmond, which means the entire South will have about 300,000 soldiers when it's said and done for the rest of the South. You put all of your you put all of your people up here at Richmond, and by putting half your soldiers in Richmond during this time period, you divided yourself to be conquered. They should have stayed in Montgomery. It'd been a whole different ball game if they stayed in Montgomery, and I'm not going to Richmond, Virginia here after Fort Sumter. Okay, now. Jefferson Davis is sworn as president of the Confederate States of America. Abraham Lincoln is sworn as the president of the United States of America. Okay, the first major concern, and you need to remember this, the first major concern of Abraham Lincoln are his federal forts. You got federal forts across the South. You got Fort Monroe, you got Fort Pickens, you got Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter, South Carolina, in Charleston Harbor, is running low in medical supplies, food, and clothing. Abraham Lincoln sends word down to Jefferson Davis 
to allow him to resupply his federal force. Jefferson Davis tells him he can, as long as he does not bring any kind of weapons. As long as it's food and medicine and clothing, that's just fine. The governor of South Carolina does not see it that way. He says, a federal ship comes into our harbor, it's considered to be an invasion, and we shall make war against that ship. All right, one of the greatest problems that Jefferson Davis will have as president is that his governors will not obey his orders. The Southern governors believe in states' rights. They believe in states' rights. And so therefore, they're gonna do what they want to and not what the Confederacy wants them to do. So in other words, these Southern states, these Confederate states are nothing more than banana republics. These, these governors are little dictators over their state. I'm gonna give you an example of this. In 1865, in January of 1865, we are down to 100,000 soldiers in Richmond. And these boys are hungry and they're ill clothed, they're ill clad. A lot of these boys are barefooted, they're, they're, their uniforms are ripped up, they got big holes in them. And these boys are actually freezing to death. They're trying to build campfires to keep themselves warm. So they're eating handfuls of parched corn. That's all they have. Jefferson Davis gets word the governor of North Carolina has got over 100,000 brand new uniforms. These uniforms come with boat with boots and belts and pistol holders and, and capes and coats and hats, the whole nine yards. Everything they need, the governor of North Carolina has it. Jefferson Davis sends word to rip down to Raleigh from Richmond and asks the governor of North Carolina to please send him those uniforms. I want to tell you guys, those uniforms could be loaded on wagons and been in Richmond in about two days. It's not too far from Raleigh to Richmond. Okay. Well, guys, the governor gets the word and he says, no, I'm not going to send my uniforms to Richmond. They're for my boys and not for his boys. They're for my North Carolina boys but not for the boys who are in Richmond. Well, guys, half the boys in Richmond were North Carolina. The boys who were left over toward the end of the war were from, from, from Georgia and the Carolinas and Virginia. The, South, the rest of the South had done being conquered and given up on all of this stuff. Okay? So you get an idea? States' rights do not work. The biggest problem of Mr. Jefferson Davis was his governors. They would not obey the federal mandates. They would not obey what he wanted them to do. And they saw themselves as being individual little countries. You know, when Sherman went through Georgia in 1864 and tore up Georgia in November and December of 64, Governor Cobb of Georgia started proposing that Georgia secede from the Confederacy and start a new country called Georgia. You can't win wars, you got people like this. It ain't gonna happen. So on your fatal flaws, you can put on their states' rights and the Southern governors. They would not work. Put on there, Jefferson Davis did not get along with Alexander Stevens. They moved the capital from Montgomery to Richmond. So all these fatal flaws start adding up. They did not industrialize and they did not build good railroads. Here you have it. Here you have it. The United States. President Lincoln developed that telegraph system across, across, from the court, across from the White House. And that telegraph system had several dozen telegraph operators and they were wiring news and ordering supplies across the fire service, across the telegraph service. He had a worldwide web. I mean, a telegram, if you order mini balls at eight o'clock in the morning in Washington, D.C., and you send the order to Springfield, Illinois, by that evening, the train's being loaded with mini balls. And they might have four or five train cars that are being loaded with mini balls. And oftentimes, these trains would have five or six or 10, 10 cars behind the locomotive. It'd go about 40 miles an hour because of the load. It wouldn't go 60, it'd go over like 40 or 35 miles an hour. But you'd have two or three train cars full of soldiers and then three or four train cars full of supplies and they're going 40 miles an hour across the north to the battlefields, to the place they are needed here uh, in this time period. New York Harbor, 
the United States took an old island out here in the middle of Hudson, in the middle of the Hudson River, is called Ellis Island, E L L I S, and turned into a, and turned into a, a um, depot. There's a big, huge depot dump here on Ellis Island, and they brought in barges, and they brought in boats, and so forth, and they took supplies down where they needed them here, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay region. They were well supplied here out of New York City on Ellis Island. When the war comes to an end, Ellis Island is going to be repurposed into an immigration center. By 1900, all you newly arrived immigrants are going through Ellis Island. So you start seeing how the North is really working to win a war. They're going to industrialize this war. Well, guys, in, in the early part of April of 1860, 61, April 6, 1861, Mr. Lincoln sends word that these, that these forts need supplies. These federal forts need supplies. Davis agrees to it. The governor of North Carolina, the governor of South Carolina said no way, it'd be an invasion. And he orders that his military school, the Southern Military School, our West Point of the South, was called the Citadel here in Charleston. And General Beauregard from Louisiana had come over and he'd made his name in the, in the Mexican War, General Beauregard comes over and he takes the boys from the Citadel and he puts them around the port, around the port here at Charleston. Local men come out here and join up with them. So you have a, you have a barrage of various people out here who have come to defend Fort Sumter, okay? When the federal ship shows up on April the 12th, 1861, these men begin to fire upon the ship and start shelling Fort Sumter. The ship is going to turn and leave the port. It heads back to New York City from whence it, from whence it had come. Okay. By the way, the first man who was allowed to shoot at Fort Sumter was a 75-year-old man whose name was Edmund Rufkin. And Edmund Rufkin was allowed to take the first shots toward Fort Sumter since he was one of the oldest men there. And he's a diehard Southerner. When the war comes to an end in four years, 79-year-old Edmund Rufkin is going to put a Confederate flag around his shoulders, around his front. He's going to hold it with this hand. He takes a pistol and blows his head off. He said he would not live under Yankee rule. That's a diehard Southerner. It's a diehard Southerner. You look at today's politicians and today's political scene, and you see people who are so dead set toward one person running for the president and another one dead set toward the other president, you got Edmund Rufkin. They're just so much tuned in to one to one agenda that they cannot hear anything else. And you've seen that all across America. All right. It's part of, the, part, part of the political problem. You know, George Washington told us all of this. And we refused to listen to him. This should have never have happened. And I just wondered if Washington had served a, a third term or if Jefferson had been then more in tune in this time period and James Monroe in his time period, maybe slavery would have ended before 1820 for the whole country. But it did not happen that way. When the word from Fort Sumter goes Washington, D.C., it scares Lincoln. The people up north starts a rattling cry for a war. They attacked our federal ships, they attacked our federal fort, and therefore we have all the rights in the world to declare war on the United States, on the South, on the South. People, war was not declared. This is an undeclared war between both sides. Abraham Lincoln is going to send out a message across the North that he needs a hundred, he needs 75,000 soldiers to fight for the North. You take the 10,000 in the army already, you take the American Navy, which is always prepared. The American Navy is ready from, from, from the get go. And Lincoln says, I want 75,000 volunteers to join the, to join the Union Army so we can have a fighting force together if we need them. And he put General McDowell in charge of this forces. General Edwin McDowell becomes in charge of the, of the United States forces that are in Washington, D.C. 
Jefferson Davis in return is gonna call for 100,000 men to join the Confederate army. Remember, he is starting from scratch. Abraham Lincoln has a 75 year old country that's been this, this has matured over all these years and they have got together. The Confederacy is brand new. They're starting from scratch. And they don't have the policies, not the, not the Navy, not the Army, not the supply networks or anything the North has. They are starting from scratch here. Okay, and that can be another fatal flaw for the South. They're starting from, from the very beginning, trying to create a country and fighting a war at the same time. You can't do it. It's too much on your plate to try to do all this stuff. Okay? Jefferson Davis tells his men, you shall serve for one year. Mr. Lincoln told his people, you'll serve for 90 days. Both men saw a short war. They didn't realize they were going to turn into a major war with over 6, 600,000 casualties, deaths, and going for over four years. They did not realize this. Okay? They totally underestimated it. You know, one of the generals for the North in this time period was named William Sherman, William Tatomska Sherman. He was big buddies of U.S. Grant. They had served together in the war in Mexico. Both were big buddies of each other. When Mr. Lincoln went through and declared that he wanted an army to be here for 90 days, General Sherman started criticizing Lincoln as being short-sighted and being nothing but a bipartisan politician. And he told his general friends that this war is going to be a long, drawn-out war and it's going to kill a lot of people. And they deemed that Sherman was insane. They want to go through and decommission him and get rid of him because what he said here about Lincoln and about a long drawn out war. U.S. Grant says, don't you worry about those boys, you're going with me anyway. And we'll show them and we will tell them and demonstrate to them what American army is really about. Okay, so Sherman and Grant are pretty much together here in this war. A lot of people don't look, don't, don't think that Sherman is very smart. They think he might be on, on, the, on the little bit on the insane side. And so they don't quite trust him. Okay. Well, guys, they drew the battle lines and the South decided to move the Confederacy to Richmond, Virginia. Well, Mr. Lincoln has decided the best map, the best manner to end this war quickly is to go into Richmond the first day of the Confederate Convention, the Confederate, the Confederate Congress meeting for the first time and displace them. Go and conquer the Congress of the Confederacy first thing. Okay. The plan here, guys, is to take the city of Richmond around the 25th day of July of 1861. General McDowell has several months to get his men prepared. He's got close to 25,000 soldiers in Washington, D.C. McDowell's got uniforms for them. They all look pretty impressive here. They march, in, they march up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. They march around town. They got a band that marches with them. They're pretty impressive. The people in Washington, D.C. are proud of their boys. Down in Richmond, You've got three generals that are trying to plan a counterattack. You have Mr. Beaudegard, PTG Beaudegard from Louisiana. You have James Longstreet, and you have Thomas Jackson. These three men are very capable soldiers. I want you guys to realize something. Both the North and the South have the best generals in the world at this time period. These boys have all been trained at West Point. They were brothers at West Point. They were roommates at West Point. And now they're fighting against each other. And both armies are very talented. If I should ask you what's the weaknesses of the North of the South and the greatness of the, of the North, don't you put down the generals. They're equal. They're equal in their abilities here to fight a wolf. Okay? Don't y'all forget that. The generals are pretty equal here in this time period. Okay, well, McDowell and Longstreet and Beauregard decides to take their soldiers, some 50,000 soldiers, and carry them to a little place that is called Manassas Creek. 
Manassas Creek at a place called Bull Run. And Northern history is called Bull Run and Southern history is called Manassas Creek. We're gonna just call it Manassas Creek at Bull Run. We're gonna take care of both sides here at one time. Well, along the creek, along Manassas Creek, which is not a real wide creek, a country boy could jump it pretty easily. They had put up some stone walls and put up some stone bridges going across the creeks. This is old tobacco land. This is old, big, large fields that had once been tobacco land. And now they are mostly grazing cows on it. And so the walls were put up to keep the cows corralled. Well, Longstreet took his boys, some 15,000 of them, and he put them on the southern side of this large tobacco field, this large, huge, huge open grassland field. On the south end was a lot of timber areas. A lot of woods were down here, and the boys stood in the edge of the woods. General Beauregard went up to the northwest of the battlefield up here, and he found a gentleman who had a house that lived up here. He, he, had, he had some farmland here, and Mr. Beauregard convinced this, young, this gentleman to allow him to use his house as his headquarters during this battle up here at Bull Run. The man's name was Wilmer McLean. Wilmer McLean lived here at Manassas Creek on Bull Run. After the battles up here, and several major battles did take place in this region over a period of time, like hundreds of Southerners and hundreds of Northerners, they said, we're gonna leave and get out of this war. We're going somewhere else to live. Do y'all know that 300,000 Americans left the East Coast, both North and South, and went out West during this war? They fled. They were refugees from the war. And they went out to California and Colorado and Oregon and Washington and those areas. They left the East Coast because of war. Whenever you have war, you're going to have refugees. And McLean becomes one of them. And he decides to move his family down towards Southern Virginia, out of the way of all these battles at a little place called Appomattox Courthouse. He'll be here about three years before Mr. Grant and Mr. Lee will meet in his house for the surrender. The war began and the war ended at the house of Wilmer McLean. Okay. So Beauregard takes the northwest corner of the battlefield. General Jackson decides to go along the stone walls. He put his boys behind the stone walls and the man conducted his army standing on a stone wall. After the battle up here at Manassas Creek in 1861, Jackson gets the nickname of Stonewall. Stonewall Jackson gets his name here at Bull Run on Manassas Creek in 1861. on that Sunday morning before the Monday when they met in Richmond, McDowell's army got up early, like four o'clock in the morning, they started marching. They went across the Potomac River and made their way into Northern Virginia. When the people of Washington DC saw them leaving, they got excited. The women had on Saturday, you that's knew that's going down here on Sunday, the women on Saturday had gone and dried up chicken, they had all kinds of baked potatoes and deviled eggs. They made some baked beans. They had cakes and pies. And they packed themselves a big picnic lunch. And the entire family, grandma, grandpa, all the kids, all the cousins, anybody in the family, they all loaded up on their wagons and their buggies. And they took across the Atomic, Atomic River to make their way into Northern Virginia. They come to watch the battle. They come to eat and watch the battle. Down in Richmond, the civilians in Richmond got excited about the battle taking place up here at Bull Run and they decided to be up there to watch it. And they too went through and they made their sandwiches and they went through and had their roast beef sandwiches and they went through and made their, made their fried chicken and potato salad and the whole nine yards, pies and cakes and cookies and they took off from Richmond heading to Manassas Creek. This is the beginning of American football culture in America. 
these folks are tailgating. They come up here to tailgate to eat their food and then watch the big battle take place out here at Manassas Creek. McDowell's army comes marching in. They look awesome. The sun is glistening off their bayonet, about off their uh, bayonets. Their medals are shiny. Their uniforms are click crisp. Their boots are polished. They look immaculate coming across in their blue into Manassas Creek. The Southern Army didn't look so impressive. They did not have uniforms. These guys were wearing mostly civilian outfits. You couldn't tell a civilian from the Army here in the South. When McDowell's army hits that stone wall, Jackson's men come up and the battle begins. General Beauregard brings his men in from behind. And the battle is going, is raging on. About 45 minutes to an hour later, General Longstreet told his boys to holler as loud as they could on the edge of the woods. If you stand on the edge of the woods and you holler, it echoes across the fields. And they hollered as loud as they can. This is called the Rebel Yell. It's an old Scottish tradition that comes to the American South from the British Civil War when all those Irish, when all those Scottish men came down from Scotland and came to the United States or to the British colonies to get out of the British Civil War. You hear the rebel yell at every major football game, high school, college, whatever, pro, whenever they make a touchdown. That is the rebel yell. So that becomes part of the sports tradition also. When those 15,000 boys yelled in the edge of those woods, it's like 100,000 boys were in the woods. When that yell took place, it spooked the Northern boys and they turned and they ran. General McDowell and his generals and his lieutenants and his, and his colonels and majors could not get the boys back in order again. And they fled back to the Potomac River and they crossed over. Okay. Jackson, McDowell and Longstreet I'm sorry, Jackson, Longstreet, and Beauregard are going to give chase to, McDow to McDowell's army. And once the Southern Army reaches the Potomac, the, Potomac, the Potomac River, they stop. And these generals says, we ran them off, boys, we ran them off, and they won't be back. We ran them off, we ran them off, and they won't be back. What if the South had crossed over the river? They could have won the war in the first battle at Bull Run in, Ju in, in July of 1861. They could have done what Lincoln wanted to do to Richmond, but take Washington, D.C. They could have occupied it. They could have captured the president and then sued for peace with the United States. So when your biggest fatal flaws is, at the Battle at Bull Run, they did not invade the city of Washington, D.C. They could have done it. They could have easily have done it. You know, they said the Army ran over all these spectators, that there were picnic baskets and paper and food scattered all over Northern Virginia when those boys retreated. It's amazing. It is totally amazing. This battle at Bull Run is going to scare Abraham Lincoln. He realized that this war is going to be a hard fought war. And he's going to need more volunteers to fight this war. And by the way, the North did depend upon volunteers. There's some drafts proposed from time to time, but volunteers are the ones who usually, usually made up the army in this time period. All right. If you were a wealthy person, you could buy your way out of this war. If you're an industrial owner, you're exempt from this war. So this war becomes a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. But are all wars like that? Are all wars poor man's fights and rich man's wars? Pretty much so. Okay. If you're also wealthy and you didn't want to fight in this war, you could hire a man to fight for you. They're called substitutes. Substitutes 
were hired to fight for individuals who could afford to hire a substitute to fight for them. Okay, a normal army general, a, a normal army soldier would make fifteen dollars a month. Substitutes made it made thirty dollars a month, and oftentimes the substitute was a newly arrived Irishman or a new or a newly arrived German who can make pretty good money by being a substitute when they first arrive here in the United States. You know, Theodore Roosevelt's father is going to be a, a wealthy man who hires a substitute. Mr. Roosevelt's father was from New York City, but his mother was from Georgia. He had a Southern mama and had a Northern daddy. And that's why Senior Roosevelt did not fight in this war because of his wife, who's had a lot to do with this. So he hired a man to fight for him. You know, if you hire men to fight for you and all of them get killed, you can have nine lives. You just keep replacing them as they get shot off here during this time period. And Mr. Roosevelt, Theodore, declared that his father was a coward. And he says, when I get older and I can become part of the military, I can become part of the political scene, I will prove the Roosevelts are a bunch of American heroes. And that's gonna motivate Theodore Roosevelt and his career, because his father did not fight in this war. He hired a substitute, okay? So both in the North and the South, they start really preparing themselves for the future. What's well, gonna take place. I wanna tell you guys, between July of 1861 and 1862, there are some skirmishes that take place, but there's not really any major, big, huge battles, okay? because both sides are preparing for the future. Jefferson Davis realized the city of Richmond must be fortified. They brought enslaved workers from across the Confederacy to Richmond, and they started digging trenches. They went 17 miles to the east, the north, and the west of Richmond, and they dug a trench system, a trench network. It goes to the James River 17 miles downstream and ends on the James River 17 miles upstream. And they totally circled the city of Richmond with this trench. They also made wooden hedgehogs out of pine trees. These are like big, huge log spears. And they stuck those logs about every 12 inches apart into the fortification of these trenches, mainly in the, in the, in the the, the levy part, the lip part of the trenches where they put these big, huge wooden hedgehogs. The people couldn't get through them. They went 10 miles from the city of Richmond and built another trench line around the city of Richmond. This will not be completed until early 1862. Both these trenches were completed in 1862. They stayed in Montgomery, there'd been no need for this. They could, instead of being building trenches, they could build, build building industrial plants along the rivers and bringing people in as a workforce. They spent all this time playing in the dirt, trying to dig these trenches here to take the city of Richmond. Okay? It's gonna be a real problem. So Richmond is fortified during this time period. Washington, D.C. President Lincoln realizes that he has no idea of how to fight a war. The man has never been part of the army. The man has never fought anything. And he's concerned about his ability to lead the Union Army to victory if he is not educated toward war. He's going to call in the general. The general's around 75 years old. He's well-known general. Everybody respects him. And his name is Winfield Scott. General Winfield Scott comes to the aid of Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln tells Scott, I have no idea how to fight a war. I do not know war strategy. I don't know anything. And I want you to tutor me. You've taught at West Point. You've been a commander at West Point. You know all about war, and I want you to help me. Remember that Winfield Scott had ran against Mr. Franklin Pierce for the presidency four years earlier, or five years earlier. And he had run as a Whig party candidate. Well, now he's part of the Republican Party with Mr. Lincoln. And so Mr. Scott is more than happy to have Abraham Lincoln and his knowledge of how to fight a war. 
and Mr. Scott is going to give Lincoln a reading list. He goes to the Library of Congress and he borrows these books. And he sits down, he starts reading. He reads about the Phoenicians, the Fertile Crescent, Alexander the Great, Helen of Troy. He reads about the 300, the Spartans and the, and the, the soldiers from Athens. He reads about Cleopatra and the Egyptians and all their wars they fought. He reads about the Caesars of Rome and how they went into the Netherlands and the, and the, and the, and the areas of Europe to conquer. They conquered England in this time period. So he read all about the Caesars and the emperors and all these men of, of, uh, of the Roman Empire. Then he turns and starts reading about the wars of the Dark Ages. He reads about the Muslim invasion of Rome. He reads about Charlemagne and Pippin the Short, and he starts reading about the Crusades and all 13 Crusades. And then he goes through and he starts studying the Hundred Years' War, the War of the Roses. He reads about the wars that took place in Spain and Portugal and Germany. He's gonna read about the, the, the French Civil War and the British Civil War and Oliver Cromwell and Queen Catherine of France, and he's going to read about Napoleon. He's going to study American Revolution. Mr. Scott, General Scott, is going to give Mr. Lincoln a first class education in strategy for war. They said by 1862, Abraham Lincoln was an expert when it came to strategy and how to plan for battlefield attacks. But he knew what he was doing. Do y'all know he'd go over to that wire service across the street, that telegraph office, and he would see where his generals were fighting battles, and then have reconnaissance reports come in to tell him where the Southern Army was located. And Lincoln would wire his generals and said, turn to the right, there's a flank heading your way. They'll be with, upon you within the next four or five hours. Change your positions and attack the Confederacy. Lincoln started leading this war, guys. Now, half the time the generals didn't listen to him. They want to do their own thing. Who is he to tell me what to do? I'm the general. He's the president. He's up there in the office. Up there is nice and safe, and I'm out here on the battlefield. He don't know what's going on, but he did. He knew what was going on because information coming in to that telegraph office. Jefferson Davis did not have this. They had no idea that Lincoln had the first computer using the telegraph system. He, had, he was trying to send out people on horseback, couriers on horsebacks to send messages to the army in far flung places. It takes two or three days for the message to get from, from the president in Richmond out to the battlefield. Lincoln was getting his out there in about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour at the most. Makes a big difference here, guys. Makes a big difference here. But Lincoln becomes a major scholar when he comes to war, and he learned it. He learned it. You want presidents, guys, that are, that are looking outside of the box. They'll step up to a problem and meet it head on for the advantage of the American people. And Lincoln did this. I owe it to my country to become a scholar in war to help win this war. Otherwise, we could lose it. One afternoon, Winfield Scott came into the office to quiz Mr. Lincoln. I'm sure he got a kick out of quizzing this man. Lincoln was a pretty smart gentleman. And then Phil Scott says, Abraham, Mr. President, have you ever studied South America? Have you ever gone through and read about the Amazon, the Amazon River Basin and the swamps down there and all the critters, critters and creatures that live in there? Those piranha fish will go through and eat a human in, in a matter of seconds. Have you skint down to the bone in no time? can go through and get a water buffalo or, or another large animal and have it eaten within a matter of minutes. They swarm upon them here. 
Have you read about the snakes down here in South America? There's an old snake down here that grows to be about 20, 25 feet long. And he'll weigh uppers to close to over 500 pounds or more. And he's got a big old head on him. And said, this old snake will go and capture his prey by his jaws. He'd clamp down on the, on the neck of, a, of an animal, say for instance, a deer. And he would wrap his body around that animal and squeeze the animal and squeeze the life out of it but also break all the bones inside the animal. He turns the inside of the animal into jello. Then his jaw will unhinge itself and he can devour a large animal. And Lincoln says, what kind of an animal, what kind of a snake is this? He says, it's called the anaconda. It's the anaconda snake down here in South America that devours its prey by making it into jello. It will squeeze it to death and then devour it. And Mr. Lincoln says, what's your point here, General Scott? He says, the prey is gonna be the South. The North is gonna be the Anaconda. We're gonna come down here and wrap ourselves around the South and choke it off in places and wrap it up so tight that we break the backs of the Confederacy. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go through and unhinge our jaws and devour it. And the South will go back into the United States with no problems. And Mr. Lincoln says, how are we gonna do this? And Scott says, we're gonna start with the Mississippi River system. We're going to go through and attack the cities of New Orleans, the city of Vicksburg, it's got a railroad heading for Meridian. And we're going to go to Memphis. And we're going to cut Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas away from the Confederacy. We're going to take the river. Abraham Lincoln, as a young man, had traveled down the river to New Orleans several times. He went down on keel boats, went down on flat boats. And he knew the importance of the river system. And he knew if we cut off this region of the country, that the American South would lose a lot of the economy and lose a lot of its manufacturing. And so therefore, St. Louis would be cut off from the South, New Orleans would be cut off from the South, and there'd be a very little traffic along the river system. The first squeeze will be the Mississippi River system. And then he says, we'll head there across Mississippi and Alabama into Tennessee and choke it off. And then we'll make our way across Georgia and choke off Georgia and Florida. And all we have left to devour, we will be South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. You only have three states to deal with. It's gonna be a lot easier to win this war. If you leave Columbia, South Carolina on Interstate 20, and you head up toward Florence and get on Interstate 95, you can be in Richmond in about six hours, seven hours. It don't take long to get up there, okay? It's pretty, it's pretty close up here between these areas. All right, so guys, here comes the Anaconda plan. And then Mr. Scott says, Mr. Lincoln, we're gonna boycott the South. We're gonna blockade the South. We're gonna put American Federal Navy ships from Chesapeake Bay all the way down to Florida. We're going to come up and we're going to come across the Gulf here between, between Key West and Yucatan. And we're going to totally blockade the South. Now guys, we got to build more ships to do this. The first year is pretty sketchy. But by, eight, by the middle part of 1863, nobody is getting through the blockades here. Nobody's getting through the blockades. England had proposed to join up with the Confederacy during this time period. They did build a couple of ships for the South. One of the ships was called the Alabama. That ship will, that ship will eventually be lost. It's going to sink. But they did build some ships for the South here for this war. And President Lincoln told, this, told Queen Victoria and told Parliament, 
If y'all keep this up, I'm gonna declare a war on Great Britain and we're going to surround you on the English channels on both ends and blockade you and take you the same way we took Mexico. And don't think we can't do it. We won't be the Spanish Armada to be the United States Navy. And we will take you and take you out of commission and turn you into a colony of the United States. And England backed off. They saw what happened in Mexico in 1846 and 1847. So Lincoln is gonna shut the whole thing down. Do y'all know the blockade was so successful the South could not get supplies in at all? And by 1863, we have food shortages across the South. People are rising in your cities because of food. Atlanta, Richmond, Raleigh, all these towns had riots because they could not get enough food into the cities to feed the people. If you're in the countryside and you got a garden, you're okay. But if you're in Atlanta or in these large cities, you got trouble on your hands. You can't get food supply into the cities, okay? And they're trying to get food to the troops in Richmond at the same time. So it's a real problem here. The South did not really consider all of its options. They didn't realize what kind of situation they're gonna get themselves into, and very quickly. The Anaconda Plan is one of the greatest war strategies in American history. Okay. Well, in 1862, the war kind of starts back up again. And here again, the North is trying to get the city of Richmond. They're trying to get the city of Richmond. The next big battle is gonna take place here. Um, in June and July of 1862, this battle is gonna take place with McClellan's army. And by the way, uh, George McClellan becomes the new head of the Union Army during this time period. George McClellan has planned an amphibious assault on the Yorktown Peninsula. He's got 100,000 soldiers. He's put together over 400 supply ships. And here in early April of 1862, they invade the Yorktown Peninsula. George McClellan is one of those generals who's very slow to act. He should have hit that beach and kept on going, but he didn't do it. He started unloading, and he started, he kept unloading and kept unloading and all this mess and having meetings with his lieutenants and all this stuff. And finally here, guys, on June the 25th, they've been here now since April the 2nd. On June the 25th, they head toward the city of Richmond for invasion. And when they hit that 17 mile out trench, they were stopped dead in their tracks. The Union Army could not get across the trenches here, 17 miles from Richmond. They could hear the church bells ringing in Richmond, but could not get there. They could not get there, okay? Tell me about 17 miles out. That's from here to Crestview. That's from, that's from Nysel and Valparaiso to Crestview. That's how far out that wall was, okay? And McClellan could not get to that wall. And for seven days, they tried to penetrate that wall and they could not get through it. They had to retreat. They had to retreat. Several days later, on August, in August the 9th, 62, they tried on the western side of Richmond to get the city of Richmond. There's a place out here called Cedar Mountain. And the battle at Cedar Mountain, the south is going to stop the north. So the south has won the seven days battle. They have won the battle at Cedar Mountain, okay? And then on the 29th of August, they try Bull Run again. This is Bull Run number two. And here the north lost another battle. So they lost Bull Run number one, they lost the Seven Years' War, the North lost the Cedar Mountain Battle, and now they lose Bull Run number four. You know, during this time, Lincoln is trying to find a general to oversee the Union Army. And the man he wants is from Virginia. This man has been a West Point graduate. He's a hero in the Second War. He's taught and been the administrator at West Point. And he calls the man in three times, trying to convince him to join the Union Army. And on the third time, Robert E. Lee told Lincoln, I'm not gonna be your leader. 
Robert E. Lee tells Lincoln, my family is in Virginia and I cannot fight against my family and I'm going home. Well, during this period here in 1862, Robert E. Lee is in charge of the Northern troops of the Confederacy. And he decides after Bull Run number two, that maybe it's time for the Confederacy to try to invade Washington, D.C. And here they plan a big battle that goes into Maryland. It's going to go to the northwest of Washington, D.C. and a town that is called Antietam. Antietam is where they're going into. It's the 17th day, 17th day of September, 1862. Their plan is to go down to Antietam and to push these people in Washington, D.C. and take the city away from Mr. Lincoln to take to win the war here by taking the city of Washington, D.C. I want to tell you guys something. Antietam is the bloodiest battle in American history. It is bloodier than Guadalcanal. It is bloodier than Okinawa or Iwo Jima. It is bloodier than the D-Day invasion on the coast of France in June of 1944. This is the bloodiest battle in American history. We had 18 generals who died in the Battle of Antietam, 18 of them. That's nine on each side that died in the Battle of Antietam. We're gonna have close to 30,000 casualties. I think the D-Day total was something like 5,000 dead at D-Day. You got 25,000 that are either wounded or dead from this battle. It's the bloodiest battle in American history. This is also the battle in which the first African-American soldiers will be fighting in. By this time, Mr. Mr. Lincoln has been approached by Mr. Frederick Douglass. Mr. Lincoln is convinced to allow black soldiers into the Union Army. The black soldiers were paid $10 a month. The white soldiers are paid $15 a month. So you start to already see equality in the pay of soldiers here in this time period. And the generals could not believe how these African-American soldiers fought. They fought with a, with a duty to their people. They knew they were fighting to free their people from slavery. And these Northern generals who are doubtful of these black soldiers, who are very prejudiced toward the black soldiers, could not believe what freedom fighters they were. So these soldiers played a major role up here in the morale of the American fighting forces at, at Antietam, the South lost. This is the first battle the South has lost here in the Virginia campaigns of this time period. And then in December, the North tried again to come back down to Richmond. They come to a place called Fredericksburg. This is, this is December, the third, December the 19th, 1862. And here at Fredericksburg, the, the North has its, the largest casualties of this war. The Union soldiers are going to meet a death trap here. The Confederacies are, the Confederacy is ready for them, and they pretty much annihilate the Union forces here at Fredericksburg. As a matter of fact, we go to Gettysburg some eight months later. As the Union soldiers are standing on Cemetery Ridge watching the Confederate soldiers march up the field heading toward them, they are hollering Fredericksburg. Remember Fredericksburg. We're going to revenge ourselves today at Gettysburg for Fredericksburg. Okay? What's important. So the war here in Northern Virginia has pretty much stalemated. Nobody's winning and nobody's losing. But the death count, count is extremely heavy here. And Mr. Lincoln starts considering all of the carnage, how bad it was. But there's another side of Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, in February of 1862, will have the death angel come to his house. His 11-year-old son, Willie, comes down with scarlet fever. And Lincoln loved Willie dearly. Willie was a kid who was the most like Lincoln. Luckily, the kids looked like Mary. They didn't have the disfigurations that Lincoln had. They looked like Mary. So they're fairly good-looking kids. And Lincoln loved little Willie, and Willie dies. 
Willie dies here in the end, toward the end of February of 1862. And Lincoln realizes that his little boy represents all these other boys that belong to moms and dads across the country that are dying in this war. And he's got to find a way to stop the carnage here. You know, they said that Mary Todd went totally berserk when little Willie died. She brought in psychics and seers into the White House. She tried to have communion with uh, our meetings with little Willie from beyond the grave. She hollered and screamed all during the night. Lincoln finally pulled her to her side and says, Mary, darling, up on that hillside is a white building. You see that white building? If you cannot get it together, I'm going to force to have to send you up there to that white building. The white building was a Dorothea Dix mental hospital. Mary Todd Lincoln is suffering from mental illness. It's going to haunt her the rest of her life. Okay. Mary Todd Lincoln, Mary Todd Lincoln is going to heavily grieve her baby. Abraham Lincoln also grieves, but Abraham Lincoln realizes there are thousands of boys being killed in this war and their bodies are being sent home and buried just like little Willie. And he's got to find a way to stop the carnage. Okay? And what this president does is that he puts all of his time into this war. They said the man started working 18 and 20 hours a day, trying to find a solution to end this war. Antietam was the bloodiest battle so far in this war. These generals were bragging about how many boys were being killed in this war. The American boys were suffering over the attitudes of these generals, trying to be big shot, trying to outdo each other. Remember, they were all, all were part of West Point Academy. They're all roommates, and now they're trying to outdo each other. And here in September of 1862, Abraham Lincoln is going to sit down and write what is called the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, guys, listen to me. This does not kill slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation is a war strategy. Mr. Lincoln is trying to stop the war with the Emancipation Proclamation. And he sends word down to Richmond. If y'all call off this war and have a peace, and let's go into a peace agreement or a peace treaty and stop this war, I will not do anything with your slaves. I will leave your slaves intact if y'all stop this war and allow for a peace conference. And he reminded them here in the South, I could have easily ended slavery in Maryland, West Virginia, which is now a new state. They seceded from Virginia. They didn't want to join the war. So West Virginia seceded from Virginia and started a new state. So I'll take, you look at Maryland, look at West Virginia, look at Kentucky, and look at Missouri. These are all border states that have slaves, and I have not touched them. Slavery is still intact in these border states. So I will treat the entire South like I have treat Kentucky and Maryland and West Virginia and Missouri if you will come to the peace table and stop this war. I will not end your slaves if you'll come to the peace table. And your deadline is the first day of January of 1863. He's going to October, November, and December. He's going to almost a little over 90 days here to decide to stop this war and come to the peace table. But then he told them, if you do not come to the peace table by the first of January of 1863, as I start conquering your areas of the South, I'm going to free your slaves. If I start conquering the areas of the South, I'm going to free your slaves. And the South would not do it. The South had the big kick because they won all these battles here on the East. But they don't realize they're losing the West. That the United States could come in through the back door and win this war from the West. All right? Still 1862. Still 1862. Okay? Out of Mobile is going to come General Bragg, B-R-A-G-G. -G. All right, 
General Bragg is going to go. I got to stop for a second, guys. Hold on. I'll get right back with you guys. Hey, Amy. Well, I lost her. Leave me a message. I'm interested. Yeah. Hey, Amy, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing my 11th Zoom lecture for this class. <laughs> I'm trying to civil war this morning, so I'm about to get through with them. So what are you up to? Yeah, I know you are. Okay. Uh huh. Back in the class, he. Okay. 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 All right, we can do that. That'd be no problem. And uh, so, okay, this this kid has some COVID issues. That's why. I'm looking at him to do this. Yeah. No, no. What happened was that, that he didn't come to class. You know, when we go through my people absence on the new system, that they dropped it. And he had called me and told me that his grandmother had passed away. And I said, you need to let me know what you're doing so I can, I can see what's going on. But he didn't get back with me until last week. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. I'll. Yeah. Okay. So I got an email here from Dana. Let me go to them.
Where'd I, where'd I end up? Um, sorry, I had to stop for a few minutes and do some college administrative stuff. When I left off, we were discussing the 1862 time period and, and how the war in the West is gonna progress in this time period. General Bragg is gonna come up from Mobile and make his way up toward North Mississippi. Joining him here in around Tupelo is gonna be another general whose name is Albert Sidney Johnston. Albert Sidney Johnston is leading troops out of Mississippi. I later found out that my grandfather, my great grand, my great great grandfather was in the it was in the battle here and was part of Mr. Albert Sidney Johnson's army. And they fought at Shiloh. As a matter of fact, my great grandfather was born during the battle at Shiloh about 200 miles south, we're down in Kemper County, Mississippi. And I was four years old when Grandpa Will died. So I knew somebody who was born in 1862, because he lived to be an old man, and I remember him uh, as, a as a small child. But uh, Grandpa Will was born during this time period. So I have a little connection with this going on up here in this time period. Well, up in North Mississippi is a little place in Tennessee, is a little place called Shiloh. There's a church up here. And Shiloh is above the banks of the Tennessee River. And here, Albert Sidney Johnson and General Brigg is going to wait for a general from the North who's making his way to this region. This general is named U.S. Grant, Ulysses Simpson Grant. He has left the areas of Illinois, Cairo, and made his way southward down to Fort Donaldson in Tennessee. He took this fort, then worked his way down to Shiloh. His mission is to take the city of Memphis. That's his mission. And so the Southern forces are trying to stop him here at Shiloh. Now Shiloh is a battle that is fought in a forest. It's a big, huge mess out here. And the battle is going to take place for three days. On the first day, the South pretty much keeps the North at bay. They do not make much advancement here in the first battle. And this is in April, early April of 1862. Okay, on day two is a draw. Neither side really wins on day two. During the evening of day two, Special forces will come in from another general whose name is Don Carlos Buell. Don Carlos Buell will almost double the Union Army going against the South. So you got close to 100,000 men against 100,000 men out here at Shiloh. On day number three, Albert Sidney Johnson is going to make a huge mistake and get between his men and the Union Army. And Albert Sidney Johnson is shot three times. Two of the wounds are just flesh wounds, nothing much to worry about. But the third wound had gone into the back of his leg through his calf and had penetrated from each side of his boot. These boots they wore were laced up all the way to the knee. So it acts as a tourniquet. And after several, well, about five, 30 minutes after being shot in the back of the leg, Mr. Mr. Um, Albert Sidney Johnson is gonna fall off his horse. They carry him to the medic tent, they pull his boot off, and the boot is totally filled with blood. And Albert Sidney Johnson dies because the aorta in his leg had been penetrated, and the man dies. Albert Sidney Johnson was probably the greatest strategist that the South had. He was well known as being a great general for his men. The men looked up to Albert Sidney Johnson and a major loss takes place here when they lose this great general. Okay, it's going to demoralize his forces, his troops, and Mr. Grant will make his way to Memphis. And on June the 5th, 1862, the city of Memphis is gonna to fall to Union forces. So the river is now cut off between St. Louis and the South. 
The river is, is cut off at Memphis. General Grant will take his army across the river into Arkansas. Then he's going to head southward to a place called Vicksburg. Vicksburg is called the Gibraltar of the, of, the, of the river here. And they're trying to build a railroad from Vicksburg. It almost goes to Meridian. And from there, it's going to go to Montgomery and on to Atlanta. They're trying to build a railroad to get supplies into Atlanta and, and, and try to, to uh, back paddle what they've been trying to do here, trying to get supplies into the South. At the same time here, on April the 24th, 1862, Admiral David Farragut is going to enter the river, Mississippi River system, down here at Fort Jackson. And he's going to make his way up to the city of New Orleans. And on April the 25th, or April the 29th, the city of New Orleans is going to fall to Union forces. And now the city of New Orleans is now under control of Union occupiers. The general put in charge of New Orleans is named General Butler. And General Butler brings in martial law to the city of New Orleans. He's going to shut down all the liquor. He's going to shut down all the gambling. He's going to shut down the houses of prostitution. He is going to shut down the city of New Orleans. And people today still talk about General Butler and what he did here uh, in this time period. Okay? So you're going to have all of this here as part of the agenda here because the city of New Orleans is going to fall apart. Behind the city of New Orleans, David Farragut will make his way up to Baton Rouge. And here on May the 12th, 1862, the city of Baton Rouge will fall to Union forces. So now the south end of the river is closed to the Confederacy. The north end of the river at Memphis is closed to the Confederacy. The Anaconda plan is working. The only place that is still open is the city of Vicksburg. Now, when General Grant gets across the river from Vicksburg, he realizes his artillery shells will not hit the city. It's an 85-foot bank here on the, on the eastern side of the river at Vicksburg, and his artillery is going into the bank. So he sends word down to New Orleans to, to Admiral Farragut to send up uh, gun ships. They put these gun ships in the middle of the river and try to project the the projectiles into the city of Vicksburg. They're not very successful. What General Grant needs is dry land. So he calls in the Corps of Engineers from West Point Academy. And the Corps comes down here to survey a way to divert the river away from Vicksburg. Now guys, all we have are wagons, mules, and shovels. And they're going to try to divert a river that puts 4 billion gallons of water a day into the Gulf. And to add insult to injury, right here above Vicksburg, the Yazoo River comes in from North Mississippi. you got two rivers to deal with here, the Yazoo and the Mississippi River. You can't do both of them. It's going to be almost impossible. But the Corps comes in here trying to divert the river. We learned something, that this river can be controlled by the Corps. They can come in here and build levees and build runoffs and find ways to stop flooding here along the river system. And the Corps engineers will eventually put a major base here at Vicksburg. Vicksburg is one of the big headquarters cities for the Corps of Engineers. And here in recent years, not only have they been working on flood control around the city of New Orleans and try to make more runoffs and, and more areas to have flood water flow off into like the Chafalaya River Basin, they also have rebuilt the Panama Canal Zone. So Vicksburg has been pretty busy here in the last few years, rebuilding the Panama Canal and also, or I should say expanding the Panama Canal and also the flood control along the river. And we still have flood problems along the Mississippi River system because it's usually above the land. It's higher than the ground area, especially in New Orleans, okay? So guys, the West is failing while Virginia is in a deadlock, okay? They're losing the war in the West, okay? But the war in Virginia is deadlocked. I wanna tell you another thing you guys I need to realize about this. A lot of these boys from Louisiana and Arkansas and Texas get word of what's going on down here and they start deserting the Southern Army. 
They go home because their wives and kids need help. Family ties are tighter than governmental ties are, okay? Your family needs help, you go help your family. And a lot of boys deserted the army here in Virginia and went back home. A lot of Mississippi boys went back home during this time period. So for a solid year, the city of Vicksburg is gonna be a troublesome area for General Grant. Now here's what he decides to do. General Grant here in the spring of 1863 decides to put a skeleton army across the river from Vicksburg. They did leave cannons, they left tents, and they left a handful of men, about a thousand of them. Their job was to regularly shell the banks of the river to make the people of Vicksburg believe the full-scale army is still there. It's the same thing Rochambeau and Washington did across the Hudson River in the Revolutionary War. They put that fake camp across from New York to make the British believe they're gonna attack from New Jersey. The same thing here. Mr. Grant knows his war strategy and they put sun catchers on these tents and they build big bonfires and these men maintain this camp. Mr. Grant is gonna go southward. He's gonna go down toward uh, the town toward the Natchez area. And between Natchez and Vicksburg, he's gonna come inland. This is about where Windsor Castle is today. All right, they're gonna come inland and, and General Grant is going to send troops across the south side of Mississippi to put down artisan trade in these small towns. Macomb has a railroad that runs from New Orleans up to Memphis. At Macomb, they have the works plant that does all the maintenance on the trains. They destroy it. They go into the little town of Gloucester and the little town of Liberty and the little town of Crystal Springs and the little town of, of, uh, of, uh, of Hazelhurst and Brookhaven and Meadville. And in these little towns are all these little artisan trades and they destroy them. My mother's town was, was invaded by the Union forces of General, of General Grant because they destroyed the bridle and the saddle making there in Liberty in this time period, okay? And the people talk about in Liberty about when the North came into Liberty here during this war. My, my grandmother and the old ladies that I used to know who would be now be 140 years old, <laughs> All these little old ladies that I used to know who were in the 80s would go through and tell me stories about all this stuff. And I got first information about these, these Yankee Raiders who came in here, okay? And how bad they were and all this stuff. Of course, it's very slanted. I had to go through and say, okay, they're too passionate about all this stuff because they are pretty racist little old women and I understand where they're coming from. So I gotta kind of watch out for these ladies and what they're telling me here. William Faulkner used these little ladies around Oxford to write his novels with. So these stories become part of the Southern tradition, particularly during Reconstruction, and the, and the South was trying to explain itself. William Faulkner called the rage to explain, to explain what they had done and why they had done it. Well, as Grant's armies went down here and raided these little towns across South Mississippi, his main army made their way up toward Jackson. And here in Jackson, he's gonna have General Sherman with him. And here in Jackson, they're going to head toward the west. They decided to hit Vicksburg from the west. The eastern side was not, I'm sorry, they're going to attack Vicksburg from the east. The western side was not working. The eastern side might be better off. So they're heading west out of Jackson, heading toward Vicksburg. We're gonna clear that up a little bit. But yet outside of Vicksburg, they divide the army in half. An army comes in from the northwest, an army comes in from the, I'm sorry, from the northeast, an army comes in from the east. And on July the 4th, or July the, yeah, July the 4th, 1863, the city of Vicksburg collapses. The city of Vicksburg is going to be overran by the Union Army. You know, the, the general in charge of Vicksburg's name was Pemberton. He was from up in the middle part of the country. I want to say he's from Illinois. But he married a girl from Vicksburg and he decided to stay with her during this war, being the general here for the Confederacy in Vicksburg. And he sent word to Richmond, I need help. 
Over and over again, he said, I need help. I need soldiers to come down here and help me out. And the word from Richmond was, we don't have anybody. We're all tied up here in Richmond. If they did Montgomery, it had been a whole different ball game. They could have sent 100,000 men out of, out of Montgomery right into Vicksburg, and they could put down Grant real quickly. They didn't have, they didn't have the men down here to do. It. Everybody was tied up in Richmond here. And the men in Richmond are starting to flee because their families are in harm's way across the deep south. It gets real crazy here uh, in this time period. So on July the 4th, 1863, the city, of, uh, the city of Vicksburg is going to fall. And now the Anaconda Plan has totally cut off the three western states. Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas are out of this war as far as having any kind of real battles take place out here, okay? After Vicksburg, President Lincoln realizes that he has the man that he needs to help win the war in the East, that these generals out here were not really doing their job. I wanna tell you something about all this stuff here, guys, it's important. These Eastern generals, both North and South, were too friendly toward each other. On Sunday mornings, they called off the wars on Sunday. They did fight on Sundays. And these generals would send notes across the battle lines to their opposition to invite them over for brunch. And all these big cooks in these big, huge camps would go through and have biscuits and eggs and bacon and sausage and ham and all this stuff and waffles and pancakes and lots of cane syrup and the whole nine yards. French toast, you name it, they had it. And these generals would get together on a Sunday and spend all day together. They laughed, they talked, they joked with each other. A lot of times they said, you remember old so-and-so? He lived down the hall from us at West Point. What was that old boy's name that's so crazy? And they talk about people they had known in the past here. And these men enjoyed each other's company on Sundays. On Monday mornings, they're trying to kill each other again. In the same light, the soldiers did the same thing. Across the river, across the creek, might be the Union forces on the southern side or the Confederate forces. And the Confederate boys on Sunday morning would holler, Johnny Ram, what, Yank? We got some blackberries over here. Y'all want some blackberries? You ain't gonna shoot us, are you? Oh no, come over here. Y'all are friends today. And these boys came together and they spent all day. They wrestled, they played cards, they shot marbles. They played baseball. Baseball gets real popular in the American Civil War. He comes out of the wars when America's main sports is baseball. They started playing baseball. Baseball was actually established in the 1850s. And by 1865, it becomes a nation sport here. Football comes in about four years later. Basketball comes in about 20 years later. So American sports was evolving here out of this war. And they loved playing baseball against each other. They read each other's letters. They read their mail. They read their newspapers. And on Monday morning, they're trying to kill each other again. You know, I read a story about a young man in the Confederate Army. This young man had a brother who joined the Union Army. One afternoon, they had a big battle on a creek bed. A lot of boys were wounded. One of those Union boys hollered and screamed all night long from his injuries. The Confederate boys got tired. One of those boys said, I wish that SOB would hurry up and die. I'm tired of hearing his mouth. Well, about sunrise, that young 22-year-old boy died. And his 24-year-old boy across the river, across the creek that said, I wish he would die, goes across the river, goes across the creek, and he finds the boy he'd been hollering all night. It was his brother. The 24-year-old found his 22-year-old brother that he had cursed because he was suffering so getting out of here. You hear a lot of these kind of stories, guys. You know, the post office stayed very active during this time period. Letters were sent both back and forth between home and the battlefields. 
Shelby Foote, one of the greatest historians of battle of Civil War history. He's from Greenville, Mississippi. Shelby Foote decided to sit down and write the Civil War history. His three volumes is over two million words in his collection of Civil War history. And Mr. Shelby Foote used diaries. He used letters to write his Civil War history here, his correspondence here in this time period. Shelby Foote, with a friend of his from, from Green Mississippi, decided to go, his name is Walker Percy. They decided to go to Oxford here in the late 1950s. And in Oxford, they picked up William Faulkner. And William Faulkner, the great Mississippi novelist, went with the two boys to Shiloh. And William Faulkner took Shelby, Foote, and Walker across that battlefield and explained to them the battle at Shiloh and what took place here. William Faulkner was a history, was also a Civil War historian, studied a lot. So they went by, they went by, um, Oxford and picked up old William Faulkner and went over to Shiloh. That had been a trip to been on. That had been a very interesting trip to be the, be, be the fly on the wall while those three men walked across the battlefields, okay? And, and looked at all this area. But Shelby Foote did a really good job writing Civil War history. I think Florida State still uses Shelby Foote's books as, as one of their main uh, sources in their Civil War history class. And remember, that takes four semesters to take the entire class. That's how much information is involved in this war here, in this time period. I want to tell you something about this war here when it comes to the cultural war. These men try to live normal lives as much as they possibly could in their tent cities. These cities were moved regularly between different locations. One day you're in one location, the next day you're packing up heading to another location. These are actually moving cities, okay? In these camps, they have the artisans that are needed for war. They have blacksmiths, they have carpenters, they have gunsmiths, they have barbers, they have butchers, they have the bread makers, they make cornbread, they make regular bread, they make biscuits. They make cakes and pies and pastries here. You got a postal system where the mail comes in to these soldiers, they have mail call every day among these soldiers here in this time period. They had lots of seafood because they're close to the Chesapeake Bay region. So they have fried fish, they have baked fish, they have oysters, they have lobsters, they have shrimp. They do pretty well up here in the Northern armies here. The South is, is not as good as they have in the Northern armies as far as food supply. The, the North stays well supplied with food while the South suffers. They have food shortages down here. Do y'all know we had food riots that took place in these cities during this war? Atlanta, Richmond, Raleigh, all these cities had New Orleans. They all had food shortages during this time period, okay? So they tried to live a normal life in these camps. The one who made the most money in these camps were the undertakers. You know, a lot of these boys were not identified on the battlefield. And during this time period, boys would die on battlefields worldwide, and they would not know who these boys were. And so these boys started taking, taking pieces of scrap paper and pencils, and on these papers, they wrote their name and their address, their name and where they're from, their birthday and where they were from. So they would not be forgotten on the battlefields. And you did have a lot of people buried in trenches. When you have 3,000 or 4,000 dead bodies on a battlefield, it don't take long for the stench to come up. You got to buy, bury these bodies pretty quickly. Here across the South, they use a lot of slave men to bury bodies. And if you had a name of the person you could put the name on the grave site. And when they came back to put the stones up to mark these graves, they would have the names of these men. I went to the graveyard in Vicksburg. I've been to the graveyard in Natchez. And you see a lot of boys that'll say from Illinois or from Indiana or from Ohio, but the name is unknown. They do not know their names. They know who, who they were with because they're uniforms, but they did not know their names. They are buried in these graves with no names here. They're known as unknown soldiers here. And there's thousands of them 
There's thousands of them that deals that has no name on their grave sites. Okay. So the undertaker is the one who makes the most money out of this war because they will spend, they, they'll charge you $300 to go through and embalm a general. An enlisted man would bring about $30, $35, $40. But you will probably this times thousands of people to get an understanding of what's going on. This war is also highly documented because photographers are going to come to the war. And they're going to shoot all these pictures of what's going on in these battles. They shoot battle scenes. They shoot, the, they shoot pictures of the dead laying in the battlefields and so forth. This, this war is highly documented. That's what Shelby Foote also used in his book writing here about the Civil War history here, the three-volume set Civil War history. Okay? You could, guys can go to Google and Google the images from this war and see the photographs from this time period. Ken Burns and PBS did the Civil War history back in 1992 one of the greatest documentary Civil War history. Shelby Foote's one of the narrators in this. Of course, Shelby's dead now, but he was a narrator during the, the filming of the Civil War series by PBS. If you guys want a good history of this, y'all watch the PBS documentaries, and it's called The Civil War. The Valparaiso Library has it. It's part of our collection here, okay? And you can find it here and watch these movies here that deals with Civil War history in this time period. All right, so guys, they try to have a normal life here in these camps, but then you had the medic tents. These are mash tents. These doctors are going to learn how to perform modern medicine during this war. When this war first starts, we're using all kinds of iron tools. The iron tools are put into big bowls or big pans of salty water or water with liquor in them or with alcohol in them to sterilize these tools, but iron rust. If you go start digging into the body of a person trying to get a bullet out, you can also get them lockjaw or tetanus. And there's nothing to cure lockjaw or tetanus during this time period. It's a major problem. They use rolls and rolls of toilet paper to stuff bullet holes. And of course, if any of you guys had your wisdom teeth pulled and they put all that gauze back there to pack up where they pull the teeth out and it starts a stinking and you can hardly stand it, you can mention what these with this toilet paper smelt like inside of these open wounds here that these soldiers had. It's pretty bad. It is pretty bad here. Okay. So guys, this war is going to bring about modern medicine here. Even the Red Cross is gonna come out of the Civil War time period. We learned the importance of washing our hands to make sure that your hands are sterile as you go from body to body. Oftentimes these mini balls would make a big cut across your arm, or across your leg, and they could not cauterize or go through and skin graft these openings. And so the best choice was to cut them off. And the tools they use to cut off legs and arms during this time period are the same tools that you use today in your tree trimming and in your yard work that hold these guys down, they get them drunk. Sometimes they did have uh, ways to put them to sleep. They didn't have very many of them. And they'd go through and cut these legs off or cut these arms off by holding a person down. They're screaming for the mamas and for God and you're here cutting off their bones, cutting through these long bones here. And then you slice over the flaps together. And of course, if you're not real careful, you don't keep everything pretty sterile and pretty clean, you're going to get gangrene, a flesh eating. This is a major problem. And they kept cutting as the gangrene kept spreading. I read a story about a little 17 year old boy from Georgia who got hit by a cannonball in the back of his leg. He blew it, they blew his calf off and they cut his leg off just below the knee. Well, again, Green got into all that stuff and they cut, his, they cut off his quad. The infection kept spreading until they finally cut off his hip and it killed him. It's pretty bad. Y'all read the diaries of these Civil War nurses like Kate Cummings from Mobile. And she worked from Mobile all the way to Richmond working on soldiers who've been wounded during this war. She's a very important person is Kate Cummings, okay? So the medic tents were a horrible, horrible place to go to. And then we had the POW camps. 
the Northern POW camps were in Elmira, New York. They were in around Columbus, Ohio area. We had a piece of POW camp in Fort Hood, Texas. It was so hot out there, the men died from heat stroke. We had a, a POW camp at Catawba up here above Montgomery. It's northwest of Montgomery. So Catawba was the old capital of Alabama. Actually, it's more, it's more west of, of Montgomery than it's northwest. And Catawba was a major POW camp. And then we had a camp at Andersonville, Georgia. The boys at Alamara, New York, the northern boys hired, held up here, did not have clean drinking water. There was wiggle worms and all kinds of scum and mess in the water here. The boys were forced to drink. In Ohio, it was so cold, the boys could not stay warm in the wintertime. You know, my, my grandpa, Henry Weatherford, his mother's name was Julie Moore. And Julie Moore's daddy, Owen, was a soldier in the war. He was at Shiloh. He was up here with Henry Weatherford my great great grandfather owen moore was 19 years old during this war and at shiloh he tried to retreat from the advancement by the union soldiers and got hit in the back of the foot with a cannonball and he couldn't walk and he got captured and they carried owen up to the pow camp in ohio and Owen Moore told my grandpa, Henry, he says, Henry, that was the coldest place I've ever been to. And he says, I'm still chilled from living up there and all that old cold weather up there in Ohio. He's a POW guys from April of 1862 until May of 1865. That's a long time to be a POW, okay? In May of 1865, they were released from POW camp. They carried the boys down to the Ohio River and put them on a steamboat called the Santana. And on the Santana, they sailed down to Vicksburg. And here in Vicksburg, the boys were released here, were marked off the roster, and they were free to go home. And Owen told Grandpa Henry, he says, Henry, when I got off that boat at Santa on this, off the Santana there at Vicksburg, I saw a bunch of boys who were half starved. These were full grown men who weighed less than a hundred pounds. Well, these boys had come from, from Catawba and from Andersonville. We only had one person executed for war crimes out of this war, and he was a warden at Andersonville. Every hour, some 30 boys died at Andersonville. They were dying like two, two minutes apart from each other at Andersonville. It was horrible here. And Andersonville is not too far from here, guys. Y'all go up there on a day trail. It's outside of Columbus, Georgia. It's up there toward Americas. Georgia is where Andersonville Prison is located. Just go to Dothan and go through Bainbridge. You can be there in a little time. Or go through Eufaula and turn and go about out that away from Dothan. But the prison is close by. The boys at, over in Fort Hood, Texas, were dying from heat stroke. But Owen Moore told Grandpa, my Grandpa, about going off the boat there at Vicksburg and seeing all these half-starved men. And he asked them, he, he says, where are you guys from? They said, well, we're from Ohio and Indiana, and Illinois. But he says, no, where'd y'all come from? What got you in this kind of shape? And they said, we were POWs at Catawba and at Andersonville Prison. And these boys weighed, weighed us 100 pounds. But these boys are going home. They are going home. Owen told Grandpa about how he walked all the way from Vicksburg, all the way to Meridian. And what a time he had trying to find food, that nobody had any food. He told Grandpa he went through, how he went through and wrestled a bone from a dog. Feed that bone marrow. Well, guys, the Santana, you know how airliners come into airports and they'll be here for like an hour and get refueled and Reserviced and all this kind of stuff and get cleaned and all this. That's how steamboats were. They would come into a port city. They'd be here about three hours. They reloaded the coal on board the ships. They put more water in the boilers. They kind of took care of the maintenance of the boats. They made sure all the tables were clean, the chairs were clean, and all this kind of stuff. They kind of picked up. And that's what they did here on the Santana. Owen said he's just outside of Vicksburg, here's the Santana whistle go off, talking about leaving the port. Is going to head up the river, heading back toward Memphis. And these boys were heading home. 
and Owen realized here how bad this war had been for everybody. Not only had he suffered, but these boys in the South had really suffered as POWs because they were not fed properly. At least he had some good food along the way. The Santana is about 30 miles below Memphis and it blows up. The boiler had not been well maintained on this boat and the boat blows up and all these boys died. All these POWs from Andersonville and from Catawba died on the river. If that boat had blown up between Memphis and Vicksburg coming southward, I would not be here to tell you the story of Owen Moore. That's why I tell you guys to get your family stories. To hear these stories. And Grandpa told us the stories of Owen Moore when I was a young man and a little boy. And I heard all this stuff. I learned my history, my family history as a child, sitting in the laps of my grandparents, or sitting in a, in a chair across the table from my grandparents, or sitting in the pickup truck going to town with my grandparents. There's always opportunities to learn here, guys, and to learn your family history. Okay? So this war is a very brutal war. This war has got people on the move, a lot of death and a lot of destruction. Now I mentioned a while ago how we had the Emancipation Proclamation and the South did not agree upon it. The city of New Orleans, the city of Memphis are under federal control by the spring of 1862 which means in the 1st of January of 1863, the, free, the slaves are freed in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and in Memphis. Once Vicksburg falls, the slaves are freed in Vicksburg. The Emancipation Proclamation is allowing people to lose their slaves. It's giving slaves the chance for their freedom here in the cities that they conquer across this region. I mentioned a while ago how Mr. Lincoln pulled Mr. Grant out of the West and carried him to Washington, D.C. to head up the Northern armies. Mr. Grant went up here because Mr. Lincoln was tired of dealing with these generals who would not do anything. They would not capture their foes when they had a chance to capture them. They let Robert E. Lee and all them sneak back into the South. After Antietam, he sent word to them, go capture the Southern army. Now's the time to end this war. And these generals did not do it. And Grant realizes, or Mr. Lincoln realizes that U.S. Grant will end this war, that he's not in here to play around, that he's here seriously to win this war. You see guys, Mr. Grant after the Mexican War is left out west with the army, fighting the Apaches and other groups of Indians out here. And the man gets really depressed and he starts drinking. And by 1852, Mr. Grant is forced to leave the army because of alcoholism. And he goes back home to Ohio. This war redeems him. This war redeems General Sherman. They find the redemption through this war. And so Grant realizes he's got to work extra hard because it's all against him. He's got to come out of this alcoholism. He's got to find a way to regroup himself and recover himself from these situations, from these problems, okay? Mr. McDowell, I'm sorry, McClellan, George McClellan, had been off and on as a leader of the Union Army. Mr. Grant, Mr. Lincoln had fired him several times and brought him back because nobody else was better than he was. And finally, in 1864, McClellan is fired for the last time. And they bring Grant in to take McClellan's place. Okay? Well, McClellan decides the war is not winnable. And he joins the new Democratic Party, who call themselves the Copperheads. The Copperheads tell the American people that this war is not winnable. That this war is not winnable. Okay, they tell him the war is not winnable and therefore the war needs to come to an end. That Abraham Lincoln is killing people for the sake of killing people. McClellan blames Lincoln for all the troubles of this war. And in the, in the summer of 1864, the Democratic Party selects 
it's going to slack McClellan to one run for the presidency. It looks as if George McClellan could win the presidency in November of 1864, and Lincoln could be out. Lincoln could be out. The polls are heading toward Link are heading toward McClellan. You see, guys, the American people have an eight an 18 month span when it comes to war. After 18 months, we're ready for a war to come to an end. And this war is now going into the third year, and the people are tired of it. It's been twice as long as it should have been, and people are tired of it. Okay? So there's a good chance the Copperheads could win this war. Okay? Now, when Grant leaves Vicksburg, heading back over to Washington, D.C., to head the, the Army of the Potomac, he's going to give orders to General Sherman to go across the South. General Sherman is going to leave Vicksburg and makes his way to Clinton. And from Clinton, he goes to Jackson. And from Jackson, he goes to Brandon. From Brandon to Pillahatchie, from Pillahatchie to Newton, and on into Meridian. It's called the Meridian Campaign. And during this, during this march across Mississippi, General Sherman realizes that his men can eat off of the land. They can raid, they can raid barns, they can raid smoke houses, they can raid, they can raid family homes and find food. You see guys, these rural people did have gardens. You don't have gardens in Atlanta. You don't have guard gardens in Richmond. And people trying to get food in from the, from the farms had a hard time getting food into these larger cities to feed all these folks. That's why you had food shortages here in this time period. So Sherman learned, realized he can live off the land. From, from Meridian, he's going to go to Tuscaloosa and make his way up toward Winfield, Alabama, and make his way on up toward the city of Decatur, the little town of Decatur, this old fort that Andrew Jackson had built that has turned into a community by this time period. And from Decatur, he's going to march into Chattanooga. And here in 1863, in early 1864, he has major battles across Mississippi, northwestern Alabama, into Tennessee. And of course, one of the big battles up here is a battle at Lookout Mountain. And General Sherman is going to take the city of Chattanooga. The Union Army will also secure areas up here north of Chattanooga into the areas up toward Nashville. So Tennessee, Alabama, the northwestern part of Alabama, Mississippi is being cut off here from the war as General Sherman marches through. And of course, in these locations where general where people are left to occupy, where the Union Army is left to occupy, they're going to free the slaves. Okay. By the spring of 1864, General Sherman decides that it's time to turn and head toward the largest industrial center of the South, the city of Atlanta. It's going to be slow going. The general he goes against up here is named General John Bell Hood. John Bell Hood is 33 years old and has been severely wounded several times. He had got shot in the leg and had to cut his leg off. I want to say they cut off his right leg. And then several months after he recovered in another battle, his horse rolled over him and his left side was totally useless. His men were forced to tote him out to his horse and tie him on his saddle to lead battles. He was tied to his saddle so he wouldn't fall off here, guys. I think I'd go home to the women folks if I was him. I would not be a part of the war here being tied to a horse here trying to fight battles. And, of course, out here in western Georgia, northwestern Georgia, a place called New Hope, the, the Confederacy is going to have the Union Army run all over it, and General Sherman heads to the city of Atlanta. He arrives here in early September of 1864. Okay? He takes the city, and he's told not to go any further until after the election. So he sits here in Atlanta from September to the early part of November. General Sherman is forced to stop. The orders came from President Lincoln. He says, by you taking the city of Atlanta shows the American people that I am trying to win this war. We have now gotten Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee, and Texas 
out of this war. And they realize the war is now depending upon Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia. The Anaconda plan is working. Okay, the Anaconda plan is working. Okay, so Mr. Grant and Mr. Sherman are formalizing the last stages of this war, how to bring this war to a close. Okay, now in Washington, D.C., some major events are happening during this time period. The Congress is under a Republican Republican House and Senate, you got a Republican president, and they're getting stuff done. In 1862, Solomon Chase, the head of the Treasury Department, is going to bring back the national banking system. The national banking system is going to give financing to industries that are having to fight this war. Abraham Lincoln has industrialized this war, and the banking system is paying for the new war machinery. Okay, in 1862, they passed the Transcontinental Railroad Act. We surveyed the railroads in the 1850s and 1862 and 1864. We're starting to build the railroads across the country. The Great Northern out of Chicago, going to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and on into the Puget Sound. You'll have the, the, you'll have the Central Pacific and you'll have the Union Pacific. They will join up out here in Utah in late 1860, 1869. You'll have the Santa Fe Railroad being built, and you'll have the Southern Pacific being built from Louisiana across Texas and on into Southern California to, to San Diego. And by 1862, these four railroad lines are totally across the country. And now we're building dummy lines and spare lines to connect us the different various towns to these major railroads, these trunk line railroads here going across the country. The United States Congress is going to give the railroads $15,000 for every mile of track that they lay on flat land. They're going to hire Irishmen and Chinese to help with the construction of these railroads. Once a lot of these African-Americans, these former slaves are freed, they will go and work for the railroads, building the railroads across the country. They're gonna use cheap labor to build the railroads across the country, okay? In the mountain areas, they're gonna give the, the train, the railroad companies, $45,000 a mile to build the railroads out here in the Cascades and out here around Lake Tahoe in this part of the world, those Chinese workers are using chisels and hammers and axes and so forth to dig tunnels through granite mountains for the railroads. These men can carve out seven inches a day. And one of these tunnels was 1,400 feet long. They use nitroglycerin. They also use dynamite out here. And those workers who carry the dynamite and who carry the nitroglycerin were, high, were paid a higher wage because they were doing hazardous work. Okay, you start seeing a new definition for work out here. Hazardous work becomes another place to look at here when it comes to people who work for a living. Okay, so here comes the railroads. Then they passed the Homestead Act in 1862. If you decide to move out into the Louisiana Purchase Territory or move out into the Old Southwest where Mexico had once ruled, the United States will give you 180 acres of land, 160 acres of land, I'm sorry, 160 acres of land if you homestead it. You go out there and you homestead it, you go through and get a clear title on that land, you put your fences up, you build your sod house, you build your barn or two, Get some livestock in there, start farming from some wheat and corn out here, live here five years, and the land is yours for free. Do you know we gave the American farmer 600 million acres of land from the Homestead Act of 1862? We gave the railroads 200 million acres of land to build their railroads on. The mining companies received over 200 million acres of land to survey to build mining camps on. So guys, 
the United States federal government gets heavily involved in financing industries. The Constitution does not talk about giving federal dollars to a private enterprise. But here we're doing it under the name of war. Under the name of war. By the way, the Homestead Act also created your, your homestead colleges, your, 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 freedmen, your free colleges, the ones that are made for your farmers to go to. And uh, we start teaching agricultural in these A&M colleges that are being formed here by this Morrell Homestead Act of 1862. Okay, so we're going to build colleges, we're going to get people land, we're going to build the railroads, we're going to build the national banking system, and President Lincoln totally industrializes this war. You know, in 1865, he told us something. I might have gone too far. I have made men so wealthy off this war that they'll want war after war to make more money. I've got to find a way to rein in these industrialists who are getting wealthy from this war. And what he planned was to rebuild the South by industrializing the South and let these men have a hand in it. To rein them back in by letting them help rebuild the South and rebuild the war, the war torn areas of the country. Mr. Lincoln has a plan to rebuild the South very quickly, industrialize the South and turn into a powerhouse that he knows that it can become. What is the worst thing that happened in 1865 is for some radical crazy terrorist to kill the president. And Lincoln's dream goes with him. Reconstruction of the American South becomes political. And that's how come, guys, we have not won the war. The war is still going on in America. We have still got the Civil War remnants. And remember, the sins of the fathers will go on for generations and generations. What if Lincoln had lived? What would America look like today? He told the American people, one day this wealthy class is going to control everything. We don't rein them in. They're going to control Congress and the Senate and the presidency and eventually the Supreme Court. And you could easily lose your democracy if this should happen. He warned us. I've got to do something here to rein them in. So his reconstruction plans were rebuild the South as quickly as possible and try to make sure these wealthy class people don't try to get so greedy they want to keep having war after war after war to rein them in. Okay? So it's very important here, guys, about Lincoln and reconstruction. Okay? Now, something else happens that's very important in 1864. In April of 1864, Death comes to the White House in Richmond. They are remodeling the White House here in Richmond during this time period. They decide to remodel the upstairs bedrooms and put balconies off of these bedrooms. On the bottom of the, on, on the, on the ground level is a cement patio or a brick patio down here. So it's going to give protection, a roof over the patio plus give you some excess out of the bedrooms onto a nice open balcony. Marina Davis was concerned because Jefferson had been losing weight. He had not been eating like he should have. So she goes into the kitchen here with her White House cooks and they make a big meal for Jefferson. They carry the meal across the street and lays out on the table there in his office, at his Oval Office, you want to call it, across the street from the Richmond White House. And while the ladies are laying the food out on the table to serve the president and eat lunch with him, here comes the White House maid. He has fallen, he has fallen. Little Joe has fallen. Little Joe's on the patio behind the house. The workman had gone to lunch during this time, and little Joe, who's five years old, went upstairs, and they had left a plank between the balconies up here, and little Joe decided to walk the plank, and he fell onto that patio head first. When they arrived at the back of the, the, back of the White House, 
little Jeff, who's about seven years old, had little Joe in his lap. And little Jeff kept saying, Mama, Daddy, I said all the prayers I know how, and little Joe will not wake up. Wake up, little Joe. We love you. Come on, little Joe. Wake up. That little boy died in his brother's arms. The body was, in, was interned. They embalmed the body. And that evening, people from across the way, across Richmond, came to the White House to pay their last respects to little Joe Davis. Jefferson did not come down from the second floor of bedrooms. He walked the floor, and they could hear him saying, not mine, oh God, but thine. He's not my little boy anymore. God, he's your little boy. You take care of my baby. You take care of little Jeff, a little Joe. He's yours now. Mary Chestnut was a wife of a cabinet member here in the Confederacy. She started a diary the day the Confederacy, the, the day the Confederacy was started with the secession of South Carolina. And every day she wrote diary entries, or I should say entries into her diaries. Her diary is a great historical research document about this war. I have the book here at the house. I've read it several times. And Mary Chestnut keeps a record of what's going on in the Confederacy. And she writes about the death of little Joe in her diary. That's the only place where I have read the entire account about this little boy's death. The next morning, they carried the body out to the graveyard. They buried him, and all the school kids around Richmond brought carnations to put on his grave. And they said, look, the graveyard had snow upon it because of all the white carnations. Celebrating the life of little Joe Davis. Okay? This took the heart out of Jefferson Davis. A lot of folks said the Confederacy ended when little Joe Davis died. The Confederacy ended when little Joe Davis died. The heart of the Confederacy was ripped out. Abraham Lincoln, however, put his attention onto winning the war. And the last major event that's going to cause the South to actually lose this war is when Jefferson Davis loses his heart toward the war. It's going to start unraveling. It's going to start unraveling. Okay? So, guys, you got a real problem here in Richmond during this time period. Okay? And little Joe Davis' death does not help a whole lot. Okay? Sitting outside here in the, in the September of 1864 is going to be the army of William Tatumska Sherman. He's holding here until the election. And in November, President Lincoln is going to win the election. Now, here's a major fatal flaw of Lincoln. He was not paying attention. Abraham Lincoln decided to bring a new man in as vice president. The man he chose was, was named Mr. Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is the only Confederate senator who did not go home during the war. Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee. And Abraham Lincoln says, I'll pay, make him my vice president so the South will see a friend in Andrew Johnson. This man had no experience on all this stuff. He had no idea about the plans of Lincoln to rebuild the South, to rein in the wealthy class. He had no idea of all this stuff. He's only going to be vice president for about about seven weeks before Lincoln is shot and killed in Richmond. I mean, is shot and killed in Washington, D.C. So he's a wrong man here, guys. He should have brought in William Seward or, Ch or Solomon Chase, his two political enemies that became his friends during the war, and they helped him win the war. Solomon Chase and Mr. And Mr. William Seward knew everything Lincoln had planned to win this war. They were on board with it. The most critical time in American history is when you lose a president. And a vice president who's not very experienced takes over. I look at Harry Truman taking over for Mr. Roosevelt. He was not the man of the time. We should have left Mr. Mr. Uh, Henry uh, Wallace in as vice president because he knew what, what Roosevelt had planned in 1945. Henry 
uh, 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 um, Truman had no idea what Mr. Roosevelt had planned for 18 for 1945 with the, to end the war with the defeat of the communists. He had no idea of all this stuff. So Mr. Lincoln made a major fatal flaw when he put Andrew Johnson in as vice president when he should have put in Solomon Chase or William Seward. Now, the only good thing out of all this stuff is that when Roger Taney died, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Mr. Mr. Solomon Chase took his place. That's the only good thing. Okay? So, guys, it's interesting here. 1864 is going to be a major turning point for this, for this war. I'm going to stop the lecture here and come back with a part two on this lecture. And I might just go ahead and include Reconstruction in with this lecture. It won't take long to get through Reconstruction. Okay, so I'm going to stop this lecture and I'll come back here in a little bit with another one.